This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The field is set, the post draw is completed, and it is time to get ready for Saturday's Kentucky Derby. Here to do that for today is Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV. We are going to pick her brain on all things horse betting, talking about her horse betting process, what she's noticed at Churchill Downs as she has been there already a couple of days so far, and her favorite bets over at FanDuel Racing for this year's Kentucky Derby. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here as mentioned by Christina Blacker. You can find Christina on Twitter at Christina FDTV. She's an analyst and reporter for FanDuel TV. Christina, happy Derby Week to do I, to you. How you doing? Happy Derby Week, Jim. It is def- definitely my favorite time of the year in horse racing. And each and every day, the anticipation, the excitement, the media attention, it just continues to build as we get closer to that first Saturday in May. And that anticipation gets to build a bit earlier, too, because the post draw was done on Saturday. We'll talk about the implications of the post draw, but you're out at Churchill Downs. So I feel like for you, it's got to be extra special being on site and, you know, just kind of getting to take in that atmosphere for a full week leading into the Derby. It really is, because I think when you spend time watching horses train in the morning, that's when you start to not only learn how they're doing physically. Like they give you some signals in their coat, in their energy levels, but you also get a little bit more of a glimpse of their personality and you can kind of see behind the scenes what they're like. And for a day like the Kentucky Derby, I think that's really important because the atmosphere of the Derby, thousands of people, the music, the noise, you have to have not only the physical athlete, but you need that mental athlete that can take it all in. So I think really learning about these horses both kind of between the ears and also yeah. in their physicality is a huge benefit as we get closer to Saturday. Well, I'm looking forward to getting your full read and what you've noticed so far, which we'll do here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast, because we're not just talking Derby. We're also going to talk the Kentucky Oaks on Wednesday by talking to Dubs Anderson of FanDuel TV. You heard Dubs on here along with Christina last year as well. So that show coming up Wednesday to break down the Oaks, which are on Friday. So get that here on Covering the Spread, the FanDuel YouTube page, and of course, on FanDuel TV Plus as well. Be 100 150th Kentucky Derby is right around the corner, and FanDuel is the only sportsbook app where you can bet it. Plus, all customers get a no sweat derby bet up to $20. That's right. Get to 20 bucks back if your derby horse does not win. So bet the derby on the same app where you bet all your favorite sports, FanDuel. Just download to score your no sweat derby bet up to $20 for the Kentucky Derby this Saturday. Must be 21 plus and reside in Arkansas, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Idaho, Illinois. Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Montana, New Hampshire, New Mexico, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, or Wyoming. Offer valid on first Derby win wager. Verified FanDuel Racing account required. Refund issued in non withdrawable racing site credit that expires on June 10th, 2024. Restrictions apply. See terms at racing.fanduel.com. Offer not available in DC. Kansas, North Carolina, New Jersey, Tennessee, or Vermont. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42 in Connecticut. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877- 770 stop in Louisiana. Visit MD Gambling Health at Oregon, Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER, visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Now, Christina, we had you on this show a couple times last year talking about horse racing, but I'm sure there are a lot of people, given the infiltration of or the proliferation of sports betting, who are betting the Derby for the first time. So one to get your read on your overall horse betting process for the people who are new to this. What process do you go through when you're researching the field before you place a wager? 
So I'll tell you a little bit about my process. And of course, you know, mine's going to be pretty lengthy, pretty in depth. This is half my job, right? Half is being on television and talking about these horses. But the real important part is all the research behind the scenes. So there are two tools that I rely on pretty heavily. One is Equibase Race Lens, which is basically like a, a database where you can pull different statistics and percentages. You can run through the pedigree lines. You can look at race simulations and watch all of the replays for all of the horses competing in the Kentucky Derby. The second option that I really use or tool that I rely on is called Thurograph, which Thurograph is a speed figure that basically boils all that other information down to one number. And then you can look at those numbers on a graph to sort of project how a horse is trending. If you're betting the Derby for the first time, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. I would love for everybody to watch those replays because you do learn a lot every time you watch a race. So you can jump onto our website, you plug in the horse's name, every single race will pop up and you can start watching, you know, how they've competed before. And you'd be surprised by how a horse will just kind of strike you as, wow, that's my horse. That's my derby horse. I saw something really special there. You can also go and and download that information. Like I said, their graph is one number. So I think if you are a beginner, it's something that's a little bit easier to understand. The lower the number, the better the horse or the better the performance and kind of take the trend from there. But if all of that is just too much and you just want to have fun and you just want to bet the Derby and it's your first time, we do have tons of selections from our team that will be available in the FanDuel Racing app, in the FanDuel Sportsbook app. We'll have lots of write-ups and info. We'll also have some videos that will pop up in there. So you can listen to kind of little snippets and maybe some synopsises of what these horses have done so far to pick your Derby horse. But I think what's really important to remember is that these horses had to run in qualifying races to get here. They all deserve a spot. So yeah. whoever you end up on, that's your derby horse. And don't yeah. let anybody talk you off it, whether that's a horse that's a favorite or a horse that's a long shot like Rich Strike a couple of years ago. They're in there because they deserve to be in there. Nobody can be counted out in the Kentucky Derby. Definitely not. And like you said, they had to earn their way here. And that's an important process. And there were prep races that led to earning these spots. So let's talk about those. Uh, When you're looking at those, and you mentioned you can go back and watch these races, you can kind of learn from them. But when you go back and look at these prep races, Christina, what stood out to you? What were your biggest takeaways about this year's field? So I think what really stood out to me along the entire process was the theme this year was almost inconsistency. And that's not necessarily a good thing. A lot of the horses that we saw along the road to the Derby, they would run these lights out blockbuster type performances. And then they'd kind of throw in a clunker in their next race. And then they'd come back with another big effort. When you are watching horses training up to the Kentucky Derby and racing up to the Kentucky Derby, what I like most is a horse that improves incrementally little by little, they get better each and every race because they're not going out there and almost overexerting themselves and doing too much and then not able to back that up with another improved race. The general rule that I kind of like to follow is your last performance is probably not good enough to win your next race. You have to keep getting better. And to me, the horse this year that has kept consistently getting better is the four catching freedom. If you're looking for the horse that fits that profile, he's so reliable. Every race he gets better. And I've watched him train this morning. And to bring it back to your first question, he's he's like a boy scout out there. He does everything right. He comes out. He frames himself up. He stands quietly. He looks really well. He walks around. He takes it all in. He doesn't act up. He's just the good kid in school that does everything right all along. (laughs) He's, He's kind of Mr. Reliable, I think, at this point. Okay, as you mentioned, that's Catching Freedom, which on the morning line, 8-1 to one, uh, to win for the Kentucky Derby. Has that been kind of your biggest takeaway from seeing these horses on track? Is Catching Freedom the one that has caught your eye the most while you've been at Churchill Downs? I wouldn't say he's the one that's caught my eye the most. I would say I've, I've just been impressed by him as I was kind of on on in his race resume. If I had to pick one horse that has visually impressed me the most, it's a horse that I did not expect, actually. There's two, the nine Encino. Encino was sort of a late addition to the Kentucky Derby by way of the Lexington, which the nickname for the Lexington Stakes is the last chance to make the big dance. It's the last race where we offer points, but it was only a couple weeks ago. It was on April 13th. So a horse that's exiting a race just three weeks ago and coming back to the Derby, that's a pretty quick turnaround. Some of these horses have had five weeks rest. Some of them have had six weeks rest to really get ready. 
Encino looks like a million dollars. He is 20 to one on the morning line. I'm not going to bet him on top, but he would not surprise me. He really has all the tools to be a derby winner. I think he's going to love the distance. He has a great style. He comes from a good barn. There's just a lot to like about Encino. The other horse that surprised me and that I just kind of feel my eyes drawn to when they're out on track and in the mornings, they reserve 30 minutes at Churchill Downs for just derby horses. Nobody else is allowed to be on the racetrack except for the derby horses and the Oaks horses. So you can have up to 200 horses on the track, but we're looking at like 34, 35 in total in that time. Doorknock is the horse that always my eyes just pull back to him. He's the one and he's actually a full brother to the winner last year, Mage. The curious thing about this is he looks nothing like Mage. <laughs> they, if you told me they came from completely different families, I would absolutely believe you. Mage was a more compact, really muscly, kind of strong looking horse. Doorknock is tall and lengthy and long. And he has in his eye, like the whites of his eyes are very prominent. And that's not always something you look for. Like when you're at a sale, they kind of talk about it. You want like a kind eye. It's not necessarily a kind eye in a horse, but there's just something about him that's really commanding. He drew the rail, which is difficult. I think it's the toughest post position to win from. But it is a storyline worth following because in the 150-year history of the Derby, to have full siblings win in back-to-back -back years has never been done. So it's pretty incredible just to, to see that not only that he's he's here. I mean, you think there's 20,000 horses born back in 2021 and only 20 of them make the Derby. For this family, this dam, this mare, and the father to have two in back-to-back -back years is just remarkable. Yeah, as you mentioned, Doorknock drew the one post. And I want to talk more about the post draw in a second. But first, I want to go back to Encino. You mentioned the short turnaround for Encino with a, a short layoff between races just three weeks. What level of concern comes with that for you? Are you are the concerns alleviated because you've been able to see Encino on track? What's your read on that tight of a turnaround before the Derby on Saturday? Yes. So that's, that's the thing. The fact that I've been able to see him, the fact that he is putting a ton of energy into his works, a ton of energy into his gallops, his coat is shiny. That's the biggest indicator. He's carried his weight really well. Sometimes after a big performance, horses will lose a little bit of weight and you just need to give them some time to kind of let down to rest, to put that weight back on and just to build back up. He has not lost any weight. So I don't have any concerns about Encino on the quick turnaround. And that's something that I've been surprised by just because he looks so fantastic in the mornings. Okay. So Encino catching your eye based on what you've seen there. Also liking door knock, uh, uh, drew the first post and then catching freedom. Also impressing you based on what you've seen so far at Churchill Downs. So let's talk about the post draw overall. You talked about the implications of door knock being on the rail there. We also had fierceness of favorite drawing the 17 post. So Got a lot of range on where the favorites are for Saturday's race. So any horses for you, Christine, who got bumped up or bumped down based on where that, that draw shook out on Saturday? Yeah, you know, I have to say, I don't think that there were any real, you know, losers from the post draw. As I mentioned, I think the one is difficult. I don't care who you are, no matter what horse you are, if you end up in the one post, I just think that's tough. Fierceness, and you're going to hear this a lot over the next several days. Drawing post 17, there has never been a winner in the Kentucky Derby from post 17. And Fierceness is our morning line favorite at five to two. But I am not worried in the least about it because one of my colleagues, thankfully, did all the work already. Joaquin Jaime <laughs> pulled the charts and the odds of the horses that have left from post 17 in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And we're talking a lot of long shots. We haven't had a horse like fierceness in post 17, a two-year-old champ, a horse that on speed figures just towers over this field. But back to the point I made about the inconsistency, fierceness is last race in the Florida Derby. I mean, he could run several lengths slower and still beat all of these horses on Saturday. But his race two back in February in the Holy Bull wasn't nearly as brilliant. So if fierceness comes with his A game, I think he's just unstoppable in here. And I like the post draw for him because what I've noticed about fierceness in watching his races, he likes to be the horse on the outside that's a little bit dominant and kind of applying pressure to other horses. He doesn't like to be trapped inside. He doesn't like to be shuffled back. He kind of wants things his own way. But from post 17, he'll be able to get it. So at this point, I'm kind of leaning towards him because – I think coming back to his race in February that wasn't so good, I think Todd Pletcher thought 
that he could bring him over there at like 60, 70% and he might still beat those horses and wanted to bring him along a little slower, a little more intentionally, because of course the goal is May the 4th. The goal right. wasn't February 3rd. You wanted to get the points to get there, but you didn't need to peak until this weekend. And I think he really is peaking this weekend. So post-wise, don't listen to all the noise about fierceness in post-17. If he loses, it's not going to be because of post-17. Uh, down along the inside, there's two other horses that I think are, are going to be fine with the inside post, the two Sierra Leone and the three Mystic Dan. So Doorknock in the one is going to come out running. I think he wants to be pretty forwardly placed. He's going to have to be because otherwise you think all those other horses are going to lean towards the rail and he would get shuffled back. Sierra Leone, the two, and Mystic Dan, the three, they're both closers. They both want to drop back. So the fact that they're drawn alongside each other is a good thing. They can both take a hold. They can both drop back, and they can let whatever other chaos with anybody else that wants to get to the lead go to that position. And it also helps Dornock because he's not going to be fighting those first two horses next to him for the early lead. So I think overall, there weren't any major losers. And it's, it's not just where they're drawn. It's who's next to them and what the other strategies are. And it's actually pretty complimentary where they've ended yeah. up. So an ideal draw is how it sounds like. And that's uh, a good so. thing. We want to see these horses running their best without the outside factors influencing things. I want to go back to fierceness. You talked about the speed it paired with the inconsistency. Now, it sounds like the inconsistency for you is OK. Like, let's say you're looking at this strictly from because I know you do a lot of numbers based research. Are the numbers primarily leading you to fierceness? Is that kind of the key draw yes. for you? Or are there other horses who can be on fierceness's level from a numbers-based perspective? No one has been on his level yet when he is on his A game. And uh, when I mean A game, I'm talking about his last race in the Florida Derby and the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, which was at the end of his two-year-old season. And those were the races that Todd Pletcher was pointing for. These are the races where he's trying to get his best performance. So when he's on his A game, no one's been close. I mean, I mean, it's and it's not to be offensive to any of the other horses. They're all getting there, yes. but he is several lengths faster right now. I, I, I can see a scenario where fierceness sits right on the outside, that trip that American Pharaoh got, that trip that Justified got. And when he turns for home, I can see him opening up by five, six, seven lengths on this group. It really, he is that good. He has shown us that much brilliance. Sierra Leone is another horse that I think is an exceptional animal. His style is completely different, though. He's going to drop out the back, as I mentioned. The thing about Sierra Leone that is unique, most horses have that one kind of burst and acceleration they can sustain that for about three furlongs, three quarters of a mile. What I've seen from Sierra Leone so far is he can do it for five furlongs, five eighths of a mile, six furlongs. I mean, he gets rolling like a freight train. And he's, you know, that that idea with race cars where they drop and drag, he yeah. has that. And you can yeah. watch him, his whole belly gets lower and it's yeah. like every stride gets longer as he's reaching. So he's going to have to go wide. He's going to have to cover a lot of ground. And if fierceness is 10 lengths ahead of him as they turn for home, that's a lot of ground to make up. But I think if Tyler Gaffleon puts him right down the middle of the racetrack, I have a lot of confidence that he will come flying at the end. Now, obviously, with horse racing, you bet on more than just who will win. You can bet on top two, top three, and things like that. Is Sierra Leone one of your contenders for a, another spot here for focusing on fierceness primarily as that that number one slot? Definitely. I, I think if, if I was to give you sort of four or five horses that would be in my, you know, choosing from a win bet kind of category, Sierra Leone, the two would be one of them. Catching Freedom, the four who we mentioned would be one of them. The eight, Just a Touch, we haven't mentioned him yet. Just a Touch would be one of them. Uh, fierceness would be one of them. And then if I could throw one other in, there's this wild kind of X factor with Forever Young, the horse from Japan. He's undefeated. He's five for five so far, and I think he's the best international raider we've ever seen in the Derby. So if you're looking for, I think he's going to get bet down. The Japanese horses take a lot of money, get a lot of support. I don't know you're going to get the value that you want on a horse like Forever Young, but he is a win candidate in here. Okay, Forever Young, the 11 post, uh, 10 to 1 on the morning line for Saturday's Kentucky Derby. All right, Christina, moment of truth. I give you one bet. For the Kentucky Derby, which horse are you betting on there? 
is it the no sweat win bet? Do I get my, do my money Let's back or it. am I just going for like, just go in for it for the win? If I'm going to start with my no sweat win bet and for anybody that that's doing this, like pick your price first, use mm-hmm. the promotion to your advantage and then make another or, you know, two or three other win bets. If I'm going to go for the no sweat, it would be the eight just to touch. I mentioned him at 10 to one. He has been second in his last two races, but he was second on a really fast pace in the bluegrass. Sierra Leone was the winner that day. But I think Just a Touch ran a winning performance, and I don't think he's going to take a lot of money. I think he's going to end up somewhat forgotten in here. So you might get 15, 20 to 1 on Just a Touch. So he would be a horse that I would use for the no sweat win bet. (sighs) Fierceness is going to get – he's probably going to end up as your favorite and probably close to the 5 to 2. I mean, that's, that's great value on a horse like this that's been the favorite in every race apart from the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. We shockingly got 16 to 1 on him in the Juvenile because he was coming in off a poor performance last out. But I'd probably be using that second kind of saver to play a trifecta, to play some exactas. I would use Fierceness. I would use Just a Touch. I would use Catching Freedom. And then I would throw Sierra Leone in there in the mix as well. I want to go back to Just a Touch. You mentioned you don't think Just a Touch will will catch a lot of money. So let's say, like you, you like Just a Touch right now. Are you waiting until Saturday afternoon, basically, to place that wager under the assumption that those odds might lengthen during the day? Yeah, I think you can watch that bit because the Derby betting opens so early. You have yeah. such an advanced, you know, time window. So. I wouldn't wait too long only because you think of the kind of slam effect of everybody on their technology trying to get there. Uh, But yes, I would probably want to keep an eye on how the money is going in that first, you know, from Oaks Day into about 12, one o'clock that afternoon. But maybe at that point, make your decision. The Derby doesn't go off until 6.57 Eastern. So you do have a lot of time. But yeah, I would wait a little bit to see what's happening and and see where the the money is going. But don't wait too long because the last thing you want to do is get shut out. Okay, so keep an eye on Just a Touch. See where those odds go. Once things open Friday morning, see if you can maybe get a better number than 10 to 1. But keep tabs and t- probably look to place that by Saturday around noon or so. Now, Christine, I know today is your study day. You mentioned out at Churchill Downs, but I did want to at least give you the option. You don't need to give anything out as far as like other races on Saturday or Friday. Anything else you're considering right now? Or is that a later Monday type operation for you? So, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, can I give you my Oaks horse? Because I absolutely. think I'm pretty Please do. set on that. I really like Thorpedo Anna in the Kentucky Oaks on Friday. She's the five horse for Kenny McPeak. She's run four times in her career. She's only lost one of those races. She's three for four lifetime. She was second in the Golden Rod, which was at the end of her two-year-old season. And I think she was just a little over the top at that point and kind of needed a break. She ended up with a break. She came back with a race at Oaklawn in Hot Springs, Arkansas, in the fantasy. I was there that day. And, I mean, she could have won from Hot Springs to Little Rock. Like, she (laughs) was flying down the middle of the racetrack. And she's another one that, again, this week, being able to be out there and see her, she looks like a keg of dynamite. I mean, she's about to explode. She looks so good. And on numbers, she's right there with the top, you know, contenders. I think she will – probably be about your third or fourth choice. I don't think she's gonna be a crazy price, but um, I'm leaning Thorpedo Anna and just FYI in the Oaks, but probably Thorpedo Anna on top. Okay. Thorpedo Anna, just FYI, considering that for the Kentucky Oaks, I really appreciate that, Christina. That should be a lot of fun. We'll get a full Oaks breakdown with Dubs Anderson, as mentioned, on Wednesday as well. But that is Christina Blacker. Make sure you check her out on FanDuel TV. Find her on Twitter at ChristinaFDTV. They are out on site this entire weekend. Uh, Christina, enjoy- it's Monday. I can't say weekend yet. They're, they're out there the entire week. But Christina, enjoy <laughs> the time. Thank you so much for swinging by for today. And good luck to you on a uh, Friday and Saturday at Churchill Downs. I appreciate it, Jim. Good luck to you and to all the viewers and listeners as well. Thank you so much. Really do appreciate that. And we'll talk to you again in the very near future. That again is Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV, a reporter and analyst over there. Find her and the entire crew out on site at Churchill Downs throughout this week on FanDuel TV. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. As mentioned, the Oaks conversation coming up on Wednesday with Dubs Anderson. Find that here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, the FanDuel YouTube page, and FanDuel TV+. Plus. You can check me out on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Enjoy the Derby on Saturday. More discussion coming up later on this week. We'll talk to you then. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 